We refer to this as our advanced alternator testing with a lab scope. Let's show you why. Let's talk about when you're going to use it first. You're going to use this when you have a charging system problem that's not easily identified. Or you're working in a vehicle that has very expensive components and you want to make a positive diagnosis before buying those expensive components. And you want to avoid a customer comeback after service. Let's talk about what we're going to be looking at here. We're going to look at the alternator diode pattern. We all know they have diodes that change the AC voltage into DC. But we're going to go beyond that. We're going to look at the field control voltage and amperage because that's going to let us do some very in-depth specialized testing and avoid those comebacks. And we're going to look at the alternator control signals and how they react to loads and how much reserve capacity we have. The regulator action is going to tell us what's happening with that so we can make those observations. Is there enough available voltage to charge the system with the headlights on and the blower on high? That's a question you need to answer. But looking just at the charging voltage with a scope may not be the best use of your lab scope. Let's look at why. Here's the voltage. I want you to see is this voltage line is nice and smooth. There's nothing rippling in it. It's 14 volts and we have current down here at about 30 amps. We're using our 600 amp probe so we can measure voltage and current. But we could just as easily have done this with a voltmeter. We don't need to use our big guns, the lab scope. Let's tell them what we're going to be thinking about using a lab scope. The alternators in the diode should produce a very small ripple voltage. Now this ripple voltage is measured with AC coupling. AC coupling blocks the DC voltage and allows us to measure the very small ripple voltage. This AC voltage is in millivolts, not volts. Now you just saw a 14 volt scale that looked perfectly smooth, not a single ripple in it. Here's what we get when we look at AC coupled. We're looking at AC volts, 40 millivolts. The top of the scale is 200 millivolts. So we're looking at 40 millivolts peak, about 70, 80 millivolts negative going the other way. And there's none of the pulses missing. Now remember, how did we get here? We got here because we have AC coupled. AC coupled blocks AC. Let's just look at this. Nice even patterns. Nothing is missing. Ah, oh, here's what a bad diode looks like. This diode on the right caused a drivability problem on a Chrysler. Look, it's going down to about 180 millivolts negative and it's going up to about 80 millivolts positive. Significantly bigger. But if we looked at the 14 volt scale, it's barely, barely noticeable. That's why we don't think it's a great idea to look at the 14 volt scale unless you're looking at something specific. AC coupling is much better. But let's get back to alternator controls. So we're going to look at some other things. We all know about diodes. So now we've seen good, we've seen bad. We know they can cause drivability problems. Look at this signal here on this GM. This signal is an on off signal for the alternator. They will not turn the alternator on until this voltage is either 5 or 12 volts, depending on which model you have. Most of them now are 12 volts. The alternator is turned off when we're starting the engine to minimize current flow. The other thing we need to look at is the field voltage. We have duty cycle from the field going to the PCM to tell it what the alternator load is so it can manage idle speed. In this particular alternator or generator, whatever you want to call it, we cannot measure field current because it's internal. So we're going to use the voltage here. We usually have one or the other available. And to make our connections, we're going to go in and measure that field terminal right there we're just looking at and look at it. Now, right now, field current is off where the arrow's pointing when it's up around battery voltage. This is a ground activated, ground enabled, whatever you want to call it, low side switching. When we go down to ground at the bottom, we're turning field current on full. Now, to get this pattern, we applied a 50 amp load with a carbon pile. The field current has not reached its maximum value yet, and we're talking current even though we're looking at a voltage signal, because the field current flows when we're at the bottom. So we have time at the top. So what this is telling us up here, when we have a 50 amp load like this, we have reserve capacity. We can charge 50 amps and still have more left to do so we can charge the battery under most conditions. When we're charging down here at the bottom, field current on, if it's all down here, there's no reserve capacity. 
this is the kind of thing you look for for battery running down frequently on short trips where it doesn't have full capacity. Let's go and look at these other circuits. Let's go look at the field diagram on a Ford. Here we have fusible links feeding the field terminal down there on the left. And you're seeing the connection we're going to make over on the right. First and foremost, we've got to have B plus here. There must be B plus at the field. Now, in this particular case, the regulator's internal. We don't get to see what the regulator does with a voltage signal like we saw with the GM. What are we going to use on this Ford? And remember, these are just two examples. You're either going to be able to see current or voltage in most cases. Well, we're going to take our low amps probe and we can measure field current going in here. Remember, field current is directly related to the magnetic field in the, in the windings. Here's what it looks like. We're going along fairly normal and then we turn the blower, we hit everything to max, and we go above two and a half amps. And then we turn the blower back off. Well, you can see the reaction of the regulator in current flow and we can measure the maximum amps. By applying a load we see it goes over two and a half amps. Now that's not a magic number, that applies to Ford. It's not the same number for Chrysler, Toyota, Honda. Each one has got a different value. But we are already going to be able to recognize by testing capacity if we can't keep the charging voltage up there with the headlights on and the blower on high we need to start investigating. This is showing us the reaction of the regulator and it shows us we have reserve capacity and everything else. Here's what it looks like when we put a 70 amp load. We're using all of its capacity. It's gone to full output. Now we do this because we want to see just what the current flow is. If current flow is not right we start diagnosing it. But this is what we're looking for. We're up well above the halfway point. We have no load at the bottom. We have a load applied at the top and we see the difference in current flow. That tells us we have good circuitry, good brushes in the alternator. The field must receive pole battery voltage and have a good ground. If B plus and ground are normal and the field current can't reach the maximum value, the slip ring brushes in the alternator are usually worn and we find this fairly often on these high mileage cars we're working on today. Normal field current duty cycle at idle with accessories off should leave plenty of reserve capacity if you're looking at current or voltage it doesn't matter. We should not be using max field current maximum output from the alternator for normal situations. If we are there's something wrong. Check B plus to the field and measure the max field current if possible. We've shown you how to diagnose that with your lab scope. Correct any B plus problems and identify any circuit problems that might exist in the field circuit. If all the external circuits are normal and the field current is low, it's likely the brushes are worn in the alternator. But newer vehicles have smart regulators and work a little bit different. But let's talk about the ground voltage and look at the ground voltage as a final step in alternator diagnostic. This is a ground voltage we picked off a vehicle. This again is in tenths of a volts, so we're starting off just above zero volts, going up to about 150 millivolts. 160 as we go up in peaks. This alternator ground happens to be sharing ground with the ignition module. What you're seeing here is the ignition module coming on, drawing about 9 amps and causing ground voltage to increase slightly. Now we use ground voltage on a lab scope like this so we can see these things happening. We're running about 70, 80 millivolts on this particular vehicle. This ground voltage is just teeny bit high, but not real high. We're going to 150 volt millivolts maximum on the peaks here. But we can measure it with this. We could not measure the peak voltage voltmeter. We can't see it with scan data. So finish up your testing always with ground before you condemn anything. Now let's talk about alternators that communicate. Instead of field terminals, smart regulators communicate directly with the PCM. This is an example off of a Ford. This is the communication signals between the alternator and the PCM. As we change the loads and stuff you see communications pick up. You're going to have to go check scan data for data values for the charging system. What's the target vo charging voltage? What's the actual target voltage? Do you have any charging system failures? Now checking the ground circuits, as we've said before, don't ever stop without checking the ground circuits because they have a good ground return. We showed you an example. The ignition is causing small changes in ground voltage, a little higher than normal. It's an excellent way of doing this. Always finish up because you've got to have good grounds for the charging system to work. You've got to have good connections, battery plus, and the output terminal on the alternator. You can have a little ripple voltage there as well. Look at the voltage difference between the two of them. Look at ground voltage drops. But so there's more to this 
than just looking at 14 volts in your lab scope.